Welcome back to the Unfunded Podcast, where we tell stories of founders building impactful and independent businesses without relying on venture capital or external funding. Unfunded is part of the Day One Podcast Network, dedicated to sharing the real startup stories to inspire founders, operators, and investors. I'm your host, Joan Westenberg, and we're diving into the story of another epic founder, somebody who is going a little bit outside of the accepted mold and doing things their own way. With me today is Steve Shedding from Green Atlas. Steve, welcome. Thanks for having me on the uh, on the show. Excited to chat through this. Um, I've got a bit of a background in green tech um, in some of the, the brilliant startups that are coming out of Australia. I've worked with people like GoTerra before. Um, so I've got some kind of a handle on, I guess, ag tech and that whole space. But I would love for you to tell us about Green Atlas and the core problem that you're solving. Yeah, no problem. So we're very much in the horticultural space in fixed cropping. So really think of trees when when you think of Green Atlas. And really the problem, you know, it's like anything else. We're trying to help growers to improve their profitability. But it turns out that for horticulture, that's a pretty challenging problem because prices that growers are paid are really largely based on the quality of their produce as opposed to the quantity that they produce. So it's a very different problem to Broadacre where you're really trying to maximize the output by minimizing the inputs. And instead, you're really trying to produce the highest quality fruit that's going to fetch the higher prices. And it's very, very normal to sacrifice the number of pieces of fruit uh, to get a higher quality produce. So a classic example would be an apple where to fetch the highest prices, you want a certain size, it has to have a certain crunch, a certain amount of uh, sugar content. For some varieties, you need a certain amount of blush, right? how red the the apple uh, turns. And if you don't hit those targets, then the prices fall off a cliff. You might only get 50% for the apple versus, you know, an A grade apple where you've you've hit all the metrics right on the head. And does that lead to food wastage, um, cost problems, that kind of thing? So it it can, in the sense that, uh, you know, again, I'll give you an example in, in apples. Mm. What you really want to do is to have the tree produce, you know, the right number of pieces of fruit. Let's let's say it's 100 to 150 pieces of fruit per tree, mm. but that tree is capable of producing maybe a thousand pieces of fruit. But if you let it produce a thousand, they'll be very, very low, low quality pieces of fruit with not much sugar, not much size. And so you really want the tree to only produce exactly what is needed at the end of the season. And so anything that it's doing that is not that is by definition inefficient. So Growers spend enormous amounts of time and effort um, and money to really thin down the crop in the early parts of the season. A lot of that is done through chemicals or it's done through manual labor. Um, and really what we try to do as Green Atlas is to try to assist growers in, to, in doing those jobs as efficiently as they can be done. So what is the Green Atlas solution? So what we have is a whole bunch of sensors that we mount on a vehicle. And you know that vehicle usually is manually driven, but uh, we've also got systems out there on autonomous platforms, which is, which is pretty cool. The sensors typically are cameras. We'll have one pointing to the left, uh, one pointing to the right. Very, very high powered um, flash lighting so that we get very high quality images all day, every day or, or at night. We also have a LiDAR system, so a laser-based system for measuring the 3D structure of the trees so we can measure things like how vigorous the trees are, mm. are they responding to um, you know, to fertilizer inputs, uh, are they not? Right. So we can measure lots and lots of different properties of the trees largely through either visual or structural information. What made you excited about tackling this problem? This is a pretty unique problem to, uh, to approach. Did you have a background in agriculture? I mean, the short answer for me is no, I didn't. My, my background <laughs> and, and those, those are the founders of Green Atlas. All of our background is in automation. We're all engineers. Mm. Uh, we've all worked on large scale projects. Uh, so for example, in my past, I, 
I ran the Rio Tinto Center for mine automation. You know, we automated, you know, drill rigs, you know, large pieces of equipment. So our background is very much about automation, trying to improve the efficiency of processes, you typically that are dull, dirty, or dangerous. Mm. But really the the agricultural input was my business partner, um, James Underwood. He'd been doing, I don't know, seven or eight years of R and D through Sydney University with a lot of the agricultural peak bodies. So groups like Apples and Pears Australia, uh, Horticulture Innovation, had funded a lot of the work that that he had been doing. And so Green Atlas was very much the answer to the question of, you know, that that research is cool, mm. but when can we have it? What can we do with it practically? Exactly, exactly. So James had always expected that given that we knew there was grower demand through the, the research projects, often growers would be sitting on the on the funding panels. So we knew we knew these were key industry problems and we knew that they wanted them solved, but nobody was really stepping in to say, well, how do we commercialize this research? Mm. And so Green Atlas was really the answer to, to that. Um, so James and I kicked it off now, getting close to six years ago, you know, very much to commercialize, uh, you know, what was deemed as very promising R&D. So your background in, in automation, your background in technology, that's a massive help when you're doing something that is, I guess, hard, deep tech. But there's still a, a great big mountain to climb. I mean, it's not as easy as software, is that right? Uh, absolutely. Hard, hardware is, let's say, less forgiving than software. and that's... Hardware is hard, yeah. <laughs> hardware is hard. <laughs> and I think it's, it's one of those things that's a double-edged sword. I don't think you can do the kinds of things we're doing without investing in hardware. And we're very much of the approach that um, you need to be down in the weeds, so to speak. And that means for us, you know, being at ground level, looking into the trees, getting very, very high resolution data that we couldn't get from the air or we couldn't get from a satellite. And that means investing in hardware. So the downside is hardware is hard. The upside is because it's hard, you get kind of a moat for free. Mm. So it makes uh, the barrier to entry higher because dealing with the... Um, you know, the hardware problems that you have every day, you know, really requires both a lot of expertise, but also a lot of experience. And that's that's something that the founders of Green Atlas kind of uniquely had. None of us were, you know, fresh out of uni. We all had a lot of experience out in the world in a lot of different scenarios, university, uh, the corporate world, other startups. We all had that experience prior to, prior to kicking it off. And I think that was absolutely essential. So you had the idea, you had the notion that you were going to build this, you knew there was a need for it, but hardware is still expensive. What was your approach to getting this off the ground? So that's where it gets interesting and, and very related to the to the topic of this podcast. Mm. Initially, we thought like most startups that you sort of have to go down the VC path and, and go and raise capital. Mm. Um, and we actually spent a lot of time sitting in front of VCs and uh, in fact, you know, we ended up going through due diligence twice for for multi million dollar seed stage raise. Mm. Um, so we got quite far along uh, with that, but at the same time, all of that is quite time consuming. So you have to do something in the meantime. It's a full time job doing a raise like that. It really is, and so we took kind of a multi pronged approach, which was to never assume that the raise would be successful. So that meant we looked for other sources of funding. So we were lucky enough to get a, a New South Wales MVP grant, which was a, a scheme available at the at the time. Fairly small amount of money. We put our own money into the um, into the business, but you know, not huge amounts. Really, just enough to build a prototype to prove that we could build something that was going to work commercially. And so we were doing all of that in parallel to going out and trying to do a raise. And the thing that was interesting, uh, like I said, we we got to do due diligence with with two different uh, two different firms. They ended up not going ahead for two different reasons, neither of which um, on face value were us. So nobody kind of lost faith in us. One changed strategic direction. The other one just pulled out of Australia entirely. <laughs> they just closed the office. 
But at that same time, uh, I'll admit we got very, very fortunate and a very large corporate grower approached us. So just as just as our kind of due diligence phase was um, was winding up, uh, a company approached us and said, you know, we've got a very specific problem. We've been trying to solve it for years. You know, we've got other companies and places like Sara telling us, yeah, it's easy, we can do that, but not really coming through with the goods. And so they approached us and said, look, we've seen that you've done a bit of work in apples, it seems to do what you say it does. <laughs> can you come and work um, for us? Uh, and in this case, it was it was Armand's. And we went from uh, essentially a pilot, um, you know, that got off the ground very quickly. I think within a month of first contact, we did a pilot on maybe forty hectares. They were happy, and then engaged us for five or six thousand hectares. That's huge. It was absolutely massive, and it and it was an absolute game changer because it meant all of a sudden we knew. Uh, you know, people want this. They're willing to exchange money for something that's, uh, you know, relatively new and they're re willing to take that risk. And at the same time, the scale was big enough that we went from a struggling startup to a going concern as a business almost overnight. But really, the key thing was all of that setup that we'd done in the beginning, which was not assuming that funding was, you know, guaranteed that we were able to capitalize on, on an opportunity like that. And that, that's really the thing, I guess, with, with luck is, you know, luck is as much about your forward planning as it is about, you know, the things that, you know, just fall out of the sky into your lap. Yeah, you got to be ready for the, the good things that happen, ready for those opportunities, I guess. Exactly. If you don't lay the groundwork, you won't be ready to meet them. Uh, was there any like stress when, when you had that, <laughs> that potential customer approach you? That's a, with a, a massive project. Were you stressed about whether you could make that work? Yeah, absolutely. But it wasn't it wasn't really about the technical aspects. And we, we were lucky that they were willing to go through a, a pilot stage. So we always say, you know, that the single biggest outcome of a pilot should be a go or no go, mm. right? Either it works or, or it doesn't work. And so the stress is in the pilot is really around, you know, can you make it work in the in the time that you have available? And we were reasonably confident i i would say that but certainly not a hundred percent there were things we didn't know like you know what resolution of camera images did we require was the lighting solution going to work in that you know we'd worked on smaller trees that were close to the platform now we're working on enormous trees that are very mature the things we're looking for are very far away you know, can we do that reliably all day, every day? Th those were the things we weren't 100% sure about, but by the end of the pilot, we were, thankfully, and it was all all very positive. Yeah. So to commercialize this tech, did you go through things like the um, the TRLs, technology readiness levels, or was it much more, I guess, uh, run fast and break things? Yeah, it was really more the second. Yeah. Again, yeah. having been through, you know, the corporate world, we're certainly familiar with you know the TRL levels, and we always knew where we were. Yeah. So it was very much about you know having a good understanding of where we are on those um, you know on that journey, and what we are capable of doing. So you know to give you an example, you know like a lot of companies, we very much did a lot of the um, you know let's call it the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> as long as the customer gets the result. They want the man behind the curtain. Yeah, it doesn't really matter what happens behind the curtain. So, yes. you know, the first probably the first year, it was always the founders who were out running the platform. You know, we had one system. Uh, we were testing things. I think every, every time that we went out, we were testing a new thing. It might be, you know, sometimes we'd have three different GPS units on there. Uh, we might have four different cameras. Uh, you know, so ev everything was an experiment. But we were still selling it as a commercial service because that was absolutely possible. The, you know, the customer didn't need to know it was an experiment to get value out of the out of the results. And so for that first year, you know, we would go out, we would absolutely run fast, we absolutely broke things. <laughs> but but again, we had the experience to have contingency plans in place. So if we broke something, we could generally fix it in an hour, mm. right? But that's the advantage of being very lean and having experience that 
we knew what every line of code did in our software. We knew uh, we'd soldered every wire, you know, in the cables. We built the printed circuit boards ourselves. And having control like that means that you you can very rapidly respond to you know to anything you hadn't anticipated. Yeah. Whereas the more you outsource, actually the less control you have. Yeah. And so when things don't quite go to plan, you know you've got less recourse to do anything about it. And with hardware, if things do go wrong, it's much harder to fix it in the abstract. You can't really fix it in post in the same way that you might be able to with a, a softer business. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's exactly true. But with that comes the fact that it, it, it's, it is still more expensive. Hardware is always going to be more expensive. So having, having had that first, that first client project, that success, being able to, uh, I guess the world would be bootstrap it to that point, were you tempted to, to go back and look for funding again and say, look, we've got these, these customers, we've done these thousands of hectares, we can do this, you should invest in us? Or were you pretty set on following the path? So once we had gotten to that point, we were much more willing to back ourselves mm. um, in the sense that, okay, well, we had a bit of luck. We were able to capitalize on it by, you know, just being the right place at the right time, good planning. And at that point, you know, when you've had a few VCs say to you, you know, come, come back to us when you've got more traction. <laughs> well, you go out and get that traction. And why do you need the VCs, right? If you've got a sufficient amount of traction. Exactly. Yeah. But the the other thing that became clearer the the further we went, you know, along this journey, is that my belief is kind of more and more firmly cemented that for most of the things that you will do on farm, so solutions that you would deploy, you know, in reality on a farm. So whether it's IoT type sensor devices that you deploy around the place, weather stations and, and, and so on, or whether it's something like us that's a service that you deliver to a farm. I actually think uh, those types of businesses are not really well suited to the VC model. Interesting. As well as, you know, kind of not needing the funding anymore, we also more and more formed a belief that, you know, the VC model is really not the right model. It's not that you can't find backers. Yeah. But you would absolutely need to find, you know, the right backers who are in it, probably for more than one reason, you know, certainly more than just, you know, trying a hundred times their their investment. So that that hyper hyper growth, hyper scale model, you think that's incompatible mostly with the agricultural sector. Is that right? Uh, yeah. I mean the short answer is yes, right? The longer answer is I can absolutely see a few niches where hyper growth does make sense. But my belief is, particularly with the hardware-based businesses where you're on-farm, that you're just not going to get hyper-growth. Uh, you are going to get growth, and we, we've certainly seen that for Green Atlas. Year on year, we get bigger and bigger, which is absolutely fantastic. But you, what you find is that you know, you've got multi-year, essentially validation cycles. People want to kick the tires in the first year, and if I'm honest they kind of still want to kick the tires in the second year. <laughs> and it's often only in year three that people are then willing to go, you know what, I'm going to scale this out to my my whole business. Yeah. You know, and I'm going to say, this is the way that we do things now. And then, you know, there's types of businesses where, you know, that kind of model is very compatible. Um, there are others where it isn't. You know, they're very much there are geographic business, uh, geographic issues that make things work better in some geographies than others. Like, yeah. you know, in some places you've got a small number of very large farms that works well for a business like ours. And in other places you have a very large number of small farms. And for services, what happens is that the proportion of your service that's just logistics moving from place to place goes up. And so, you know, your profitability goes down in those kinds of jurisdictions. So there's lots of little nuances that until you really start down this road, you might not think about when you're just saying, well, the total addressable market is, you know, 100 million hectares and you get very excited about those numbers. Yeah. But logistically, you know, how those numbers are actually arranged <laughs> In reality, yeah, makes a very big difference between you know can you deploy or or, or not. I often find TAM is just it's uh, 
you can get some nice numbers talking about TAM, but it, it doesn't always translate into reality. And especially not when you think about the incentives that you have for VCs versus founders versus customers. You know, so the customer wants a really good service in the long term or the product that they can count on. The the company wants to create and build something that they're proud of. The VCs, well, they want an IPO or an acquisition. You know, that's pretty much the end goal. Um, do you think your kind of long term plan for Green Atlas? Uh, do you think that would be incompatible with that VC goal, like the acquisition IPO endpoint? Is that where you guys want to go? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I think the only difference really is the the time frame. Mm, okay. You know, and and also I guess the potential the potential for the multiplier. Yeah. So I think most agricultural businesses, um, you know, we can absolutely. Um, multiply the value in the business, but again, I think just realistically, the number of ag tech businesses that are going to end up as unicorns, I think, will be relatively low. Yeah. And we're actually seeing that play out in the US at the moment, where there were a few unicorns, but they're largely being revalued by massive discounts. Yeah. That's very much. A, a current thing that is happening is watching some of these ones that uh, had massive VC backing, you know, went the Amazon model of trying to capture everything. Mm. And then now kind of in, you know, the playbook of, well, okay, well, that didn't quite work. What's what's the next best thing? And the valuations are being absolutely hammered. Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of companies who have come in with VC funding and to, to get that multiplier you're talking about, they want to reinvent agriculture, um, vertical farms, urban farms, things like that. Yeah. Whereas it seems like a lot of the the really good work in ag tech is coming from people who are asking, how can we do what we're doing better? Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it, right? Because I, I think there are two really predominant theses around ag and, and you've just hit the nail on the head, right? One is, where do I get efficiencies in the way that we produce food today? Yeah. And that's very much, you know, Green Atlas fits that mold, um, absolutely. And then the other side of it is, you know, how do you reinvent agriculture? And that's that's tough. And I don't think anyone's really winning that second one yet. You know, vertical farming still has a massive energy issue. That's kind of the the elephant in the room is how do you get, you know, the, the right amount of energy to the right place yeah. in a vertical farm, right? So, you know, I'm talking about sunlight in particular, but yeah. whatever you replace it with, if you can't get enough, you know, so there's that. There's also obviously the synthetic foods or, you know, lab grown foods, mm. similar sort of thing. There, there's been a lot of money. There's a few success stories of, you know, I love the the Vow story out of, um, out of Sydney, mm. um, but there's also been some pretty spectacular failures that are, you know, just starting to come out in the last year or two. Yeah, I think there was um, a rush of excitement sort of during and after COVID where people thought, hey, how do we fix supply chains? How do we fix food supplies? But I don't think there were clear theses and clear answers around that. It was more of a, a gold rush, but there were a lot of COVID era gold rushes, weren't there? That's, that certainly were. Hand sanitizer being the, the key one. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, um, on that, I'd, I'd love to ask your take. You've got, you've got a, a strong background in AI. What is your take on the AI funding bubble, the AI explosion of the past, I guess, 18 months, you know, we've seen um, some, of the, some of the stats that were coming out were billions of dollars more invested just in 2023 than in some of the other years put together. I think it was something like $25 billion in 2023 versus $2 billion in 2022. What, what's your take on that AI funding bubble? It's interesting, isn't it? In the a lot of that funding um, is around, let's let's say, building the tools or the building blocks. Yeah. So my my kind of take is, you know, that that's great in that you need tools and you need the building blocks. But I think that the the funding has been unfocused in a sense. In that, you know, you've obviously got big companies like OpenAI who are doing fantastically well out of building these these tools and they're making money from it. But really, I think the next wave, you know, and is really about focusing in on how do we use these tools to solve real problems that people have. 
And that's what I'm, I guess, excited about and interested in seeing is how do you take these tools that are actually quite generic, mm. but make them very, very specific to, to solve problems? So, you know, in ag, we're seeing things like, you know, can we customize GPTs, um, you know, all large language models, I, I should say, into being, you know, kind of proxy agronomists. And so, you know, they're like other fields, they're, they're putting them in front of agronomic tests and saying, you know, are you at 80% on the exam now or 90%? And they're actually doing, you know, remarkably well. So the thing that's interesting, I guess, from that is, you know, are they, are they going to be able to solve, I guess, industry-specific problems? Yes. But I think they're going to be at that generic level of, you know, what what percent chemical, you know, or what chemical should I use for this type of problem, uh, at what concentration, and they'll probably get very good at things like that. And what they probably won't have that'll be a lot harder to to build in, is the knowledge that growers have from having spent in a lot of cases generations on a piece of land, mm. and they know things that have extremely hard to encode into a into a computer system and so that's kind of what i see as the as the, as the gap so there is a wealth of data out there that farmers and, and farms have access to is that something that the green atlas would would want to tap into would want to start to access so long term absolutely and you know we're building up our own you know large databases we we are absolutely in the petabytes of data gathered on on farms and so there's a lot that you can learn you know at at those kind of scales that you know that are very difficult to learn at the small scale but then like like i said the other thing the converse is true where you know growers know things about their orchards or their blocks of land you know that are very difficult to learn from external sources um you know a good example being you know a grower told me recently Oh yeah, those trees aren't growing really well because that's where we pulled out a gum tree thirty years ago, and <laughs> nothing's ever grown well in that. Spot. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And and that's not something that you can just necessarily see when you look at a, a chart. Exactly. Exactly. So some of those things, yeah, e even from a satellite image, uh, aren't you know readily visible. You might not pick them up in a soil sample because it's it's sort of hyper local, whereas a lot of the soil sampling is sparser than that. So yeah, it, there's lots and lots of challenging problems. To get back to your question as to whether Green Atlas is, is going to look at it, absolutely. But at the moment, being a bootstrap company, we see that at the moment as being through partnerships largely. So mm. we try to make our data very accessible um, in the sense that if there's a partner of ours that does soil sampling or soil mapping, and, you know, they want to understand, well, you know, Green Atlas says the trees are more vigorous in the Northwest, right? We try to make it very easy to overlay, overlay our data onto, say, something like a soil map or a satellite map so that we can start to figure out, well, what's the root cause for the differences in vigor? Mm. Is it a difference in nitrogen levels? Is there, you know, a calcium difference in the soils there? Is it just a texture difference? Maybe you go from clays to you know to more sandy soils, and so bringing those dif different and disparate data sources together yeah, is incredibly valuable. Um, ultimately, we probably will offer it as a single service, but at the moment, we largely do it through partnerships, either with our own partners or with our partners, and we enable their partnerships that that they also have, and so that's very much again kind of a a bootstrapping, you know, solution to the to the problem. How do we get scale even in our data prior to having the you know the resources to be able to do it just by ourselves? So um, on the subject of the partnerships, you have partners in um, North America, South America, and Europe at the moment. Is that right? Uh, yep, and New Zealand, uh, Turkey, France, uh, Italy, mm. yeah, quite a few places. And the plan is to keep on expanding that footprint. Yeah, abs absolutely. Yeah, would you set up? Would you st set up and start to expand Green Atlas, like expand your presence overseas as well as those partnerships? So, I mean, yes, is the is the short answer. We will always do 
you know, really the pragmatic solution, right? So what is the best solution for, you know, a particular scenario that we see? Sometimes it will be, you know, Green Atlas should establish that presence, sometimes through through a partner. I guess just linking that to the bootstrapping story, we actually see the partnerships as being uh, incredibly valuable. So, you know, when we talk to VCs, there was very much a, a view that you had to own everything. You had to be vertically integrated. But what that ignores is that, you know, for us with partners, the partners typically already have their own established businesses. And really what they're looking for is a way of adding, you know, a new line of business to their existing business. And so we bring them that, right? So there's, and the, the quid pro quo is that they bring us credibility. They already have customers. They already have a market. And they're, if you like, pre-qualifying Green Atlas as a solution. So, you know, the customer might say, oh, you know, there's three or four things kind of like Green Atlas. And our partners can go to the market and say, look, well, we looked at all of those things and we chose Green Atlas because we think they're the best for, you know, these types of problems or those types of solutions. And so they're pre-qualifying us as a business to their customers in a new market that we've never physically been in, in, in a lot of cases. Mm. I guess that makes for a much smarter expansion strategy than anything else. And particularly if you are bootstrapped, if you are doing something like hardware, it, it makes so much sense. Exactly. So the, the key thing, um, you know, like with a lot of this stuff, is to then have credibility, right? Because how do you win those partnerships? And it's, it's simply by being credible. Um, and you do that, you know, there's lots of different ways, I guess, you would establish credibility, but that's certainly what we find is that that's really what sets us apart and why why partners are willing to, you know, spend their own money in, you know, starting a new market with us. And they, and they trust that you'll give them that support with what you're building because you believe in the product and you have the right incentives and exactly. you're not going to blow it all up in pursuit of that 100x multiplier and that makes sense too that's right and our and our model that we have with partners makes it very clear that green atlas is on the hook for you know keeping things operational you know the quality of the outputs all of those sorts of things yeah so to give our partners that that peace of mind um what advice would you give to founders who are looking to bootstrap a company um whether in the hardware space or not what what's your your kind of guidance there so i you know, look, looking back, I think there's a couple of things um, for for us. You know, particularly in that first twelve months when you know you're really establishing yourself as a business and you don't have cash flow yet. You know, cash flow absolutely is king. You know, uh, I don't think that can be unstated. And because of that, right, you really need to be able to bootstrap, and you've got to think about what that means, right? So I think that's really important. You know, could you leave your current job and have 12 months or 18 months where you're not earning any money and you're waiting for the company to earn? There's a risk that it will never earn anything. Are you willing to take that risk? Can you support yourself? Um, you know, can your business partners support themselves? Those are really critical questions, but, you know, I, I guess don't get discussed very often. They're at least as important as can we build the product? You know, is the technology going to work? Um, because obviously you want to believe that and that's all about de-risking, um, but you still need to be able to get from here to there without, you know, gobs of cash coming your way. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that's probably really the biggest decision is, am I willing to take that risk and, you know, can I get from here to there? Is there anything else you'd like to share with any unfunded listeners about the journey of Green Atlas or about um, your journey as a founder? So, I, I mean, I think I've been through really the key points, which was, you know, we we were prepared to capitalize on, you know, a few situations that, that came our way, which was fantastic. So preparedness is, is key. I think credibility is key, trying to get, um, you know, respect from your market as quickly as you can. And in something like agriculture, that's a lot easier said than done. So thinking, thinking through, you know, how do you get that? For us, it was things like um, partnering with research institutions where they would publish papers on does our system work, right? And that 
is an additional layer of credibility from an independent third party. So there's lots of things to think through like that, right? So how do I get into the market as quick as I can? How do I establish cash flow um, as quickly as I can? I I always kind of viewed it as a like a net present value optimization problem. We always knew there was a market there, but the question wasn't how do I tap into you know the largest market possible. It was much more like how do I bring forward as much cash flow as I can to to the present day, right? Yeah. And so that meant saying okay, well there's you know there's ten things we could do. But there's one thing we could do in the next three months that would be revenue generating, right? Yeah. And so that then starts to set how you prioritize because you, you're now prioritizing about cash flow um, alongside of how do I open up this you know, potentially large future market, right? You can't, I don't think you can do both of them independently if you want to bootstrap. Um, and that's probably the other key thing is yeah, how do you do the product design and implementation so that you can do a more progressive rollout? Um, and that's something we absolutely did with Green Atlas. Where you know we're six years in, there are product features we're only coming out with now that we knew on day one we had to have, but you know they weren't the right first things in order to help us generate some revenue. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, everything you're saying, just, it kind of lines up with the stuff that I'm hearing from a fair few of these unfunded startups, but you are one of the few founders who has taken this approach with hardware, um, which I think is just fantastic because hardware is hard, you know, louder for the people at the back, hardware is always hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think what you're doing with Green Atlas is is pretty incredible. To bootstrap something like this is it's very cool. Um, so congratulations on that. And Thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, where can our listeners find out anything more about Green Atlas and stay updated on your mission? So really the two best places to, to find information about us, uh, number one is just our website. Very easy. It's just greenatlas.com. Um, and if you want more regular updates about the kinds of things that we're doing or that our partners are doing, that would typically be through our, our LinkedIn um, so again, just Green Atlas uh, on on our company page on, on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time today. And thanks for being on the Unfunded Podcast. No problem. Thank you. Thank you.